Amen. Well, we have sung some rich truths and we are a people most blessed. We are privileged and we all have been endowed with so much. And one of the privileges I have is to study the Word of God and to open the Word of God with you on the Lord's Day and I never, ever take that for granted. And we return once again now to the Gospel of John. Church family, great to see you. Uh, Visitors, lovely to have you with us. We'd love for you to join us on our journey through John. You come partway through uh, our journey through chapter 3. We'll be camping out in John chapter 3, verse 16 for a few weeks. We began looking at this verse last week. If you can believe it, Christmas will soon be here. 2020 began in June, though, and so no surprise. So keep an eye out for the services that we have planned for Christmas. The plan is to enter into another Summer in the Psalms series as well. And as we did last year with the book of Ruth, preached through a small Old Testament book as well. That adds a little bit of variety, breaks things up for us a little bit. But at present, we are in the midst of the most famous verse in the world, John 3.16. So turn with me there and we'll read it together. John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Last Sunday, we waded out for the first time into this verse. It's not commonly the practice, at least with me, to spend so long on a single verse, but John... 3 as a whole, and particularly John 3.16, are worth plumbing the depths of. This is Mount Everest. This is the peak here. It's worth taking time, not rushing through this, even revisiting one or two things that when first explained may seem too complex. I realized last Sunday was quite heavy going. I purposely front-loaded all of that, but I trust as we look at it again and again and again, things will start making more and more sense. You know, about a year or so before he went to be with the Lord, J.I. Packer made this remark. He said, it is the calling of every single believer to be continually growing in the knowledge of God. You know, we're not called to be stagnant. If things are just simple, then we just stagnate. If things are too high and up in the stars, we get lost. Lloyd-Jones said one of the tasks of a preacher is to preach to both the plowboy and to the lawyer. (laughs) And we need to be continually plumbing the depths, whatever level we're at. And so be encouraged. Realize that the glory to behold is in the depths to dive into. And so what is remarkable in this single verse, as I said last Sunday, it truly is the most compact explanation of the Christian faith in all of Scripture. Contained within John 3.16 is why we believe what we believe as Christians. Notice that I did not say contained within it is what we believe as Christians. No, no. Why we believe what we believe as Christians. As I said last Lord's Day, I doubt there is a verse more well known among believers and unbelievers alike. And if you missed the message last week, I want to encourage you to pick that up online and carefully consider what we looked at together, which was the first of four parts or four bites (laughs) we'll take into 316 to digest the truth there. We considered last week the opening words of the verse, God so loved. And I made mention of that in verse 16, that it cannot be removed from all that preceded it in verses 1 to 15 of John chapter 3. That was, of course, the dialogue between our Lord Jesus and Nicodemus on sovereign regeneration, the new birth, what it means to be born again, which occurs by grace alone. And as I said last week, that includes that word whoever in verse 15. That's the same Greek word for the word whoever that we just read of in verse 16. And that word does not convey or refer to capacity 
or ability, meaning that we should not read, as we've done for a long time, whoever or whosoever to mean that whoever from their own ability or possessing their own capacity to believe, whoever believes will not perish. Jesus has been teaching in verses 1 to 15 of John chapter 3 that being born again precedes, meaning it comes before believing. Or put in theological terms, regeneration precedes faith. Verse 16 to 21, you recall, are not Jesus' words any longer. The discourse between he and Nicodemus ended in verse 15. And so what we have in verses 16 to 21 is John, the theologian as he's known from the earliest of church history, making theological declarations about the discussion on regeneration that just occurred. The word whoever, in verse 16, as it does in verse 15, simply means everyone. Or all of. And just while we're at it, and this is running ahead a little bit, but if I mention it now and your head spins a little bit, when I say it again, Lord willing, next week, it won't be so difficult or perplexing. So hang in there with me for a second. The word believe there in verse 16 is what is called a participle. A participle. And when you take the adjective, whoever, you, when they're joined together, and the adjective is the word whoever, but it's better rendered everyone. When you take the adjective, everyone, and the participle and connect the two, as they are in this verse, the best translation, the best rendering is everyone believing. Or all of the believing. And because the word everyone, whoever, in verse 16, does not refer to ability in any way, a person possessing the ability in and of themselves to believe, what must this mean? Well, it must mean exactly what Jesus said to Nicodemus. And what did Jesus say to Nicodemus in those first 15 verses of John 3? That you are born again and then you believe. Jesus did not say you believe and then you are born again. No, Regeneration, the new birth, being born again, comes before believing. To believe unto salvation, you must be born again. So we must remove from our heart, soul, mind doorpost <laughs> that whoever, in verse 16, refers to ability. Instead, we must take it to mean everyone believing. Or all of the believing. For God so loved the world that everyone believing, the ones who have been made believing by regeneration, will not perish but have everlasting life. I say that because it is crucial to see that here in John 3, Jesus teaches the necessity of regeneration, the new birth, before he teaches about faith. And so as we look at verse 316, the birthplace, as it were, the foundation for all that is contained within the verse, from the sending of the Son, to the grace of regeneration, to the gift of faith, to eternal life, all those spiritual blessings come to us from the God who is love. How vast and how deep and how immense God's love is. It's immense. Last Sunday, I offered up three distinctions, well, three distinct definitions of God's love. It's vital that we have in our mind categories when it comes to God's love. It is absolutely crucial that we have categories and definitions in our mind as to what it meant and means theologically and historically concerning God's love. Such is their importance. I want to give those to you again in the hope that they may solidify in your mind because it really, really helps. There are three ways that we are to distinguish or categorize God's love. 
There is first the love of God as it pertains to benevolence. You remember, His love of benevolence. This refers to God's love of desiring good for all of humanity, without exception, all people. We see this revealed in places like Psalm 145 verse 9. You remember, Yahweh is good to all. His mercies are over all His works, over His creation, which includes, I said last Sunday, both the earth and you and I. All of humanity is created by God. His love of benevolence goes out to all. Second, there is the love of God as it pertains to His beneficence beneficence again this refers to god doing more than just desiring good more than just staying stagnant with a stagnant love of desire this speaks of beneficence speaks of god doing more than just desiring good to all humanity but actually doing good from out of his love to all humanity matthew 5:45 one example god causes the sun to rise on the evil and the righteous God sends rain, doesn't He, to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous, all of humanity. God loves the world in that way because He is love. Remember, it's one thing to say God is love. It's fundamentally different to say God is loving. They're two totally different things. God is love. That's who He is. It is fundamentally intrinsic to his substance and nature. He is love. R.C. Sproul rightly called this the universal dimension of the love of God being manifest in his benevolence and his beneficence. The third distinction you remember that must be made when talking about the love of God is the love of God as it pertains to what is called his love of complacency. And you remember, when we hear the word complacency, we have always thought of it to mean arrogant, conceited, smug, or self-righteous, and that's how the word is used now. But the word never used to mean that. The meaning of the word complacency, like many other words, change over time. Originally, complacency meant delight, specifically a restful delight. I pointed you to the Oxford Dictionary in its third volume, which quoted complacency as this. The fact or state of being pleased with a thing or person. Satisfaction in something or someone. That's originally what complacency meant. And so I wanted to run through those again because as our Greek exegesis professor used to walk into class and say, men, what's the key to learning? We'd say repetition. He'd say, what's repetition? We'd say the key to learning. (laughs) We need those categories. We need to make that distinction. The reason we need to consider those different categories is that so that we can believe and teach that God does love all people, that God does love all humanity in one sense, and then yet, so as to not fail to distinguish the special, extraordinary love that God has for His children, who are the believing ones, made willing, made able to believe, solely by sovereign grace and sovereign grace alone. That is the testimony of God's Word. And last Sunday, I spent time highlighting that according to Scripture, and John's Gospel particularly, the deepest and the richest sense of God's love of complacency, that special love, is rooted and anchored in the special love that God the Father has for His Son. It's been well said that God can take no real complacency, meaning God can take no real delight in any but those who are like Him. And so when the Eternal Father looks at the Eternal Son, it is with a special love of complacency, of eternal delight. And since the Father can only take real complacency, delight, in those who are like Him, His special love is only directed toward His Son and all those who are in His Son, adopted into His family. You remember this? Only the beloved Son and the believing ones, who I just want to keep emphasizing all the time, 
believe solely on the sound grounds of sovereign grace and nothing else. Only the Son, only those in the Son are on the receiving end of God's love as it pertains to His special love. We saw, I made mention last week, that in the ultimate sense, life and eternal glory is not about us. When we get a glimpse that God the Father's love for His children is mediated through the Son. The only reason God can look upon us with a special love is not because there is anything special at all in you and I. That's a form of Christian narcissism. No, no. God's love for us is mediated through the Son because we're united to the Son by grace, through faith. That was all under the heading the God who loved at the very in verse 16a. That's the first of four truths in this verse. This morning would do well to take another bite. Take another bite out of this verse, turn another cog as it were, driving us further and deeper still. Why? What's the point of it all? So that we can, on a greater level, behold the glory that is revealed to us. As His covenant love and His covenant plan in the Gospel is in greater heights in this verse laid bare. The Son came to reveal the Father to us. No one had known God But what did John chapter 1 tell us? The Son exegetes, exposits God to us. And as we behold the glory of God, we are transformed more and more into the image of Christ. And so let's do that now by considering second heading, second bite, second cog, whatever you want to call it. Verse 16b, the world who sins. We've seen the God who loved, and now we see the world who sins. For God so loved the world. If the opening words of verse 16, God so loved, reveal to us the motivation for sending the Son into the world, then the words in the next part of this verse reveal to us the object of such love. The object of God's love we see there is the world. For God so loved, what's the object? The world. And right here, building from last Lord's Day, I want us to begin a little journey that Lord willing will finish on the fourth message of John 3.16. It's a little translation that we'll do. That will pull it together as we go along each week in this verse. And so first, we have God, the Father. God so, which you recall from last Sunday, is not the word so, as is so commonly understood, but simply a word that means the way or the method or the manner. God, in this way, in this me- method, this manner, loved who? Who is the object? Where is the love directed? John writes, the world. One more time. God the Father, in this way, loved the world. That's it for now. <laughs> More will be added to that as we go along. But that's it for now. Now, some want to say that the term world there is simply and solely... A word that John is using to teach and speak of humanity in general. That the verse begins in very general terms and becomes more and more specific as things go along. Now listen carefully here. The word world is a general term. It's a general term. The question we need to ask ourselves is, is it being used generally here? Why? Well, for one, the word world, cosmos, is used approximately 15 different ways in John's writing. 
I have a document that I can send you that I think it's more, but I have a wonderful document, all the Johannin uses, which is, refers to John, Johannin uses of cosmos in all the literature. It's a great document. Just email me, I'll get it to you. And so the word world is a general term. It's a general term, it's just world. It has multiple uses and it is the context that determines its meaning. Let me give you an example. I want you to all look at verse 17. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. So you have first, God did not send the Son into the world. That refers to the creation, the earth. Where did He send Him? He didn't send Him to Mars. He sent Him to the world, earth. The actual earth. That's the first use. Then second, it says, to judge the world. Now, that's obviously referring to humanity as considered all together lost in unbelief under the guilt of sin. For all have sinned, all are born into the world guilty. That's referring to humanity as a whole. And then third and last, but that the world might be saved through Him. Let me ask you a question. Is all the world saved? No. Not all the world is saved. So clearly this is referring to those who are saved, believers. You see that? Three uses of the same general word that each have their own non-general, very specific meaning. I trust you see that. Same word, different meaning. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is meant by the word world here in verse 16? And Matthew, if this verse, I'm sure, is the thought of some, contains nothing general about it as you keep laboring, then why didn't John, like the epistles do, why didn't John just use the word elect? I mean, the epistles use the word elect. They just want to say what they mean and mean what they say. And so why isn't it just saying the word elect? If what you're saying is true, why doesn't this verse just say, for God in this way loved the elect? I mean, that's what you're driving at. Well, let me tell you why John, by using the word world here, why he does so and why I believe he is conveying the very heart of the gospel message. And I want to begin by front-loading it by saying that Jesus did not die a potential atonement. Do you know what I mean by that? It's the common held view in Christianity, sadly, that Jesus hung upon a cross and the merits of that sacrifice are just waiting for people to believe so that they can be applied to them. That is not a biblical view of the atonement. Jesus did not die a potential atonement, awaiting the belief of people as to whether or not that holy sacrifice is applied to them. Jesus did not die to purchase savability. He took names, as has been well said, to the cross. You've heard me say that over the years. And really here in verse 16 is the summit for why that statement is true. The reason why John is not using the word world here to refer to all of humanity without exception is because of the very heart of the gospel message and the gospel itself. And the purpose, I would add, for John's gospel account. And what, I'm, what I mean by that is this. The gospel message goes out to all humanity. And by using the word world, even with the only, only the believing ones in mind, as is the intention... Because you would have to perform theological gymnastics to say otherwise. John uses the word world instead of the word elect 
to emphasize, number one, that the gospel message is for all people throughout the world in the sense that the world is bigger than simply just the Jewish ethnicity, but includes all ethnicities. That's number one. Number two, John uses the word world instead of the word elect to emphasize number two, that the gospel message is for the undeserving in that the world is full of sins, corruption and guilt. Why does John use world instead of elect? Those two reasons. In keeping with the gospel message and the purpose of the gospel of John itself. The world is big. It's bigger than just Jews. And the world is bad. It's full of undeserving people as a humanity all under the weight of guilt. That is why John is using the word world there. And so the love of God, His special love, for it can only be His special love that ensures that all those nationalities and ethnicities All those under the curse of sin find forgiveness and eternal life as the believing ones. That's what is meant. The believing ones who believe because they've received the new birth by love, by God's love of complacency. The Puritan John Owen, who was known both at the time and today as the Prince of Theologians, in fact, it was Spurgeon, called him, and I love this, Spurgeon called Owen the Prince of Theologians. And what was Spurgeon known as? The Prince of Preachers. <laughs> That's what, this is what John Owen wrote concerning John 3.16, quote, God the Father had such a peculiar, unique, transcendent love, being an unchangeable purpose and act of His will, concerning their salvation towards the world, miserable, sinful, lost men and women of all sorts, not only Jews, but Gentiles only, which he uniquely loved. End quote. There is something I want to do now to help us solidify all this in our mind. I want us to take some time together to see that it is not in any way unusual for God's children, that is, the elect of God, to be spoken of in Scripture as the world. That would serve us very well to do that. In fact, this is exactly what John does throughout this entire gospel. Turn with me to John chapter 4 and look at verse 42 for a moment. This is Jesus with the Samaritan woman. Samaritans and altogether other ethnicity. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is indeed the Savior of the world. That's yet another account, by the way, of John emphasizing that Jesus is not only the Savior of the Jews, but of Samaritans and all other ethnicities too. Look at John 6.51 now. Jesus speaking, I am the living bread that came down out of heaven... Why did He come? Because He was sent from the Father. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And then look at the end of verse 51. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus is saying He gives His life. That is, He atones for their sin. He gives His flesh for life. 
The only ones who receive life are believers. I love again what John Owen said of this. I think it's great. He said, a savior of men not saved is strange. End quote. Let me say that again. A savior of men not saved is strange. Think more about that. A savior of people who don't get saved is very strange. In other words, Jesus is saying, uh, John Owen saying, that doesn't exist. Look at John 6.33. Just back up there and look at verse 33. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life To the world. I want you to take verse 51 and verse 33 and think about the word life there for a moment and whether that is life to the world without exception or whether that is speaking in a specific and particular manner. Jesus gives us the answer to that in John chapter 10. So look forward there with me to John chapter 10. And look at verse 27. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them. They'll never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My sheep I give life to. Life eternal is only given to the sheep. And the sheep are scattered throughout the entire world. And the world is big. (laughs) It includes Gentile nations too. And the world is bad. For all of humanity are undeserving sinners who only deserve judgment. But from inside the love, of the eternal Trinitarian relationship between the Father and the Son, we, those who are from the world filled with ethnic backgrounds, not just Jewish, and those who are under the sin's condemnation, sinful in nature, once a child of wrath, have been loved with an everlasting love and have been united by love to the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Another example of world being used here to refer to the elect, this time outside of John, which could be helpful, is in Romans chapter 4. So turn with me there to Romans chapter 4. And look at verse 13. For the promise to Abraham... Or to his descendants, look at this, that he would be heir of the world. Was not through the law, but through faith. Now look at verse 11. Back up. Speaking of Abraham, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while uncircumcised. Look at this. So that he might be the father of all who believe. It's not in any way unusual. Or a performance of theological gymnastics. It's not in any way unusual for God's children, that is the elect of God, to be spoken of in Scripture as the world. I want us to see also now the other times that Scripture speaks of the Son being sent. And I want us to take note of for whom He is sent. The other times where the Scripture speaks of the Son being sent. Is it the world without exception? 
or the world in the more particular sense. Turn with me to 1 John now. 1 John chapter 4. And let's look at verse 9. 1 John chapter 4 verse 9. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world. That's the exact same phrase of John 3.16. So that we might live through Him. Verse 10. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. The Son sent into the world to atone for the sins of the world, but the world is used to refer to us, the children of God. Believers. We already looked at John 6.51 earlier, but listen again in light of what we've just heard. Jesus said that He is the living bread that came down out of heaven, that is Him being sent by the Father, and He said, and the bread, which, uh, the bread also which I, why I will give is My flesh, sent from heaven to give His flesh, meaning to be crucified, on that cross He died, that He might give life, eternal life, not to the world, but to His people. Romans chapter 8 now. Keep you busy this morning. Look at verse 32. He who did not spare His own Son but delivered Him over for us all, Romans 8.32. How will He not also with Him freely give us all things? Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? The Father did not spare His own Son. Didn't keep Him in eternal glory. But out of His love sent Him. A big world made up of more than just Jews and a bad world filled with undeserving sinners which we all were in our unregenerate state. God out of His love did not withhold His Son but sent Him into the world and gave Him up for us all that He might be the propitiation for our sins. I never want a toy or medal or mess with a word as holy as propitiation. I never want to redefine the word propitiation to apply it to something that it should not be applied to. Propitiation speaks of atonement. Not a potential one. An actual Look at the, think of the end of verse 32. Will He not freely give us all things? Who else other than believers are freely given all things of grace that follow after the death of the Son of God, the Lord Jesus on the cross? What are unbelievers given? What is the world given? We are given all the blessings and benefits as God's children. What grace. What amazing grace. My debt He paid. My death He died. 1 Timothy 1.15 says, It is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. My dear church family, brothers and sisters, please note 
that does not say that Jesus Christ came into the world to make salvation possible for sinners. But to actually save sinners by accomplishing their redemption. Jesus came from heaven, sent by the Father, to actually save sinners. Not to make salvation a possibility. The difference between the two is night and day. The difference between the two is oil and water. And the difference between the two is chalk and cheese. Pray that the Lord might make it click for you. That you would see even for the first time that all the language in Scripture about the cross is language of accomplishment, not potential. I beg of you. And I love you. A lot. (laughs) This is my prayer for you. That that single truth alone might click for you, be revealed by the Spirit to you, just as it's revealed in the Scripture. Back to John 3.16 now. Where the Son, the Lord Jesus, came into this world, having come from out of the motivation of the Father's love, which has as its object a world of many ethnicities and a world of an entire humanity under the guilt of sin. That is why John used the word world. The enormity of God's love here in John 3.16 is enormous because it encompasses all ethnicities and all of sinful humanity. The entire world, without exception, is under the curse of the fall. The entire world possesses a sinful nature and an inherent guilty standing. The entirety of the world's humanity was at war with their Creator. And God's substance, His love, motivated and caused the sending of His Son where He would, as John the Baptist proclaimed back in John chapter 1, verse 29, He would take away the sins of the world. If that is meant how we would immediately and incorrectly understand it, then all one would need to do is die and be justified. If the taking away of the sins of the world meant all without exception, then R.C. Sproul was correct when he said that all you then have is justification by death. Because you die, and we then believe in a universal heresy. But when John the Baptist proclaimed that, that takes away the sins of the world, it speaks of an efficacy, an effectiveness. Where the sins of the world... Which, remember, it's not unusual for Scripture to refer to the elect of God as the world. In fact, that's all that this Gospel shows. He only takes away the believing one's sin. Humanity was lost and in a spiritually dead state, dead on the ocean floor. And God's love of complacency, that special love, sent the Son into the world to save sinners and to take away their sins. The eternal plan of redemption accomplished on the cross. In that is love. In that is love. The love of our God, a God who is love. Never think lightly of the fact that we were under the curse of sin. Dead on the ocean floor. Being thrown a life raft, that is of no use. Doesn't do a thing. We needed an effectual love. A a love that was active and effective. We must never think of God's love as just this love that just hovers there. No, it is effectual. There is a result, there are consequences of God's love. And he, when it comes to salvation, this is the beauty of the gospel. When it comes to salvation, we're dead on the ocean floor. What we needed, we could not do ourselves, but God, through the Son, has done it for us. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5, But God, speaking of the Father, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us. Who is the us referring to? Is it referring to the world? 
Jesus literally prayed in John chapter 17, I, I, I pray not to you, Father, and ask on behalf of the world, but for those whom you have given me. That's what he said. Those born again, born into the household of faith, believers, believers that have come out from a big bad world. He made us alive, pulled us from the ocean floor, breathed life into us, even when we were dead in transgressions and sins. He made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. I think a good takeaway for us as we consider what we have this morning is to dwell upon the enormity of the fact that we have been, every believer who is here this morning, every child of God, we would do very well to dwell for just a moment upon the enormity of the fact that we have been loved with an eternal, everlasting love. What I mean by that is this. As a believer, as one made a believing one by sovereign grace in regeneration, as a believer, you are eternally loved. You weren't first loved when you believed. You don't do God a favor by believing in Him to earn His love. The Christian doesn't earn God's love by believing. And you and I certainly, as believers, weren't first loved when we were born again. God did not love you when He made you alive in the new birth of regeneration. He did not love you. And then when you are birthed anew the second time in the second birth, then He loves you. No. The truth and testimony of Scripture is that the Christian was eternally loved and will be eternally loved. Understand this. We were never regarded by God or even considered by God apart from His special saving grace that would be purchased for us on the cross and then applied by the Holy Spirit in time, in our lifetime, at regeneration. One Puritan has an analogy to help drive this staggering truth of God's eternal love for the believer home. And I just love this. Imagine, imagine a person in prison. They're locked away. They've committed a great crime, multiple heinous crimes. But then a payment comes in, a payment is made for the prisoner to be released. The governor then of the state, he writes a full pardon after that payment has been made. And an official then must carry that written pardon signed by the governor down to the prison and give it to the prison warden, and the prison warden then gives it, gives it to the prisoner. But the prison is some distance away. It takes a few days' journey to get there. The entire time that it takes that official to travel to the prison, that prisoner is already pardoned. The payment has already been paid. The prisoner's release has already been accomplished. It has not yet been applied. The prisoner has yet to be put into possession of his release until the official gets to the warden and the warden gets to the cell and they escort him out of the jail. The prisoner is bound the whole time until he's actually released. But he is a free man in terms of what is his once the signature is on the paper. So too with the Christian, eternally loved, 
even though born into sin and under the penalty of sin. The believer, even while born into this world as a child of wrath, is eternally loved, having been purchased by Christ, is awaiting that certain application of that certain and actual redemption. Amen. In this is love. I've been blown away how this is all a little bit different to how I understood John 3.16, my spiritual life. You know what? I just have to say this. This gives me immense comfort. I've been eternally loved. I will be eternally carried all the way to my eternal home. Where if you remember, being in streets of gold is nothing to me. Being in the presence of God is special to me. But being a part of the love gift between the Father and the Son is everything. And I know you. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we come. We've, we've touched on holy ground. I pray for anyone here who is yet to see the enormity of your love that they wouldn't leave their seat until they put their trust in the only begotten Son. The one and only Son. The unique Son. The eternal Son. The one that came from out of a, a relationship of eternal love and came to secure and accomplish the salvation of a very special people of whom we are privileged to be a part of. Lord, what immense truths we've looked at. Help us by your Spirit to apprehend them to appropriate them. Help us not to be lazy, but help us to grow in grace and knowledge. Help us not to become arrogant and prideful. I pray for this precious people whom I love. Help us to grasp the enormity of your love for us, that your love for us might be the true motivator for us to live this Christian life. And all God's people said, Amen.